Hey everybody, Craig Lieberman here. Thanks for joining me for episode one of Behind the Scenes for Fast and Furious. I have an Instagram page, as most of you know about. Uh, it's Craig Lieberman underscore 42, where I tell the story of how I was involved in the Fast and Furious movies, the first three movies, what my role was, and how my cars came to be involved in the franchise. I've also recently written a book, as you probably know, it's called Crashing Cars. It is on Amazon. Uh, if you go to Amazon.com and look up Crashing Cars book, you will find the book, and it's available for purchase right now. It's paperback. It's about 170 pages, 165 pages. tells the whole story. But by fan request, I've decided to do a, a series on uh, YouTube, so this way people can refer to the material more easily and get answers to their questions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to post specs of cars and specs on uh, certain aspects of the movie here that will kind of fill in the gaps uh, people are not finding um, on Instagram, and so maybe this will be a, a better way for people to refer to the information going forward. So let's start with the, the very beginnings. How did I get involved with the franchise? It's actually a fun story. I was uh, showing my Toyota Supra. I had purchased a Toyota Supra from a dealership lot. I paid about twenty-three thousand nine hundred ninety-five bucks for this car. Um, the car had about just under twenty-four thousand miles. It was white. It was sitting on some dealer in Whittier. Um, this dealer lot was like an old school used car lot, and it, uh, it, that car had been sitting there probably about a year. So I looked at the car, checked it out, decided I wanted it. I knew I was going to modify the car. I had uh, just come from a, a Mustang GT that was supercharged, but uh, in a little stoplight competition, I lost my ass to a Super. I said, it's time for me to get one. I always wanted one of those cars, so I went and bought one. So I modified the car, painted it yellow, did uh, you know, still in body kit, all your thing, front bumper, side skirts, and the rod mill and wing. Did the BPU, basic performance upgrades, uh, intercooler, um, exhaust, um, some tuning stuff with HKS components, and really not much else. And then, of course, uh, I did the brakes and a few other mods inside the car, did audio video. I took that car out to um, Sport Compact Car. Um, it was a competition called Sport Compact Car Car of the Year or something like that. It was a drag race, uh, an autocross, and a uh, car show on the same day. And the car took first place in that inaugural event. So uh, it was pretty cool. So I was pretty excited about it. Uh, the car had already been painted candy yellow by this point. Three days after I bought it, the car was painted candy yellow. I started doing shows. And one day I was at an import show off, I believe, up in uh, Manhattan Beach area, up that way. And this older gentleman came up and started talking to me, maybe, maybe because I was the only guy who was close to his age. And his name was David Martyr. He's the unit production, management, unit production manager. He was the picture car captain on the first movie, but UPM on the second movie. So David started asking me questions and said, hey, let's meet for lunch. I was like, okay, whatever. So uh, he invited me to this place called Delmonico's in Beverly Hills. And I went out and met him for lunch. He, we had some casual conversation. Slid a script across the table with a hundred dollar bill on it. And said, "Here, I'd like you to take a look at this, and uh, and give me your opinions of this motion picture." And at the time, I was the executive director of NIRA, National Import Racing Association. They're since gone, but NIRA was attached to Super Street Magazine. So, in my role at NIRA, I was working a lot with these marketing directors who were providing sponsorship to our series and the tuner market as people remember from back then was very big people were getting sponsored parts or discount parts and going to car shows so David and I had a nice conversation at lunch I took the script I got it on an airplane I was reading this thing on the airplane and I was laughing because some of the dialogue was really far off some of the cars they picked like they had a 3000 GT as, as the first car and then they get Brian into a Mitsubishi Eclipse which was backwards and then a scene later on calls for a target top to be ejected off the roof of this car during the hijack sequence in the desert. And so there were a lot of opportunities here to make some changes to the script. And I didn't think I was going to have much say, but I, I went for it anyway. I got back, called David Martyr. He invited me out to Universal Studios. And that was an adventure. So I show up at the guard gate, pull up in my little yellow Supra. And I said, uh, hi, I'm Craig Lieberman. I'm here to meet David Martyr. And he says, hang on a second. Goes back in his little booth, gets on the phone. He's like, he's here. Yeah, okay, I'll tell him. So he hangs up the phone. He says, follow that guard, pull over there, and don't move. I thought I was in trouble, like I was in the wrong place, like he thought I was a gate crash or something. One of those little security carts pulls over with a little siren on the roof, you know, and he says, okay, follow me. So they pull me over to the commissary, which is the big restaurant that's on the back lot of Universal. This restaurant is only open to actors and crew who are actively working on a motion picture or TV in one of the sound stages they have 
um, and the back lot. You've all seen the back lot. It was featured in uh, Back to the Future, the clock tower and all that. That's the back lot I'm talking about. So I'm sitting there, and then the whole entourage comes down. It was David Martyr, Rob Cohen, the director, Neil Moritz, who was the executive producer. He had done movies at that time like Cruel Intentions, which is an interesting movie and good movie that I like. Uh, and then a bunch of other people came down with him. Uh, Creighton Ballinger uh, was a script writer. David Ayer, I think, was there. Uh, a bunch of people from uh, that, that were uh, supporting staff and so forth. About 25, 30 people, whole entourage. They all come downstairs, and they're doing a tour around the car, and I'm opening the hood and opening the trunk, and people are asking questions at both ends of the car, so I'm bouncing back and forth. And, of course, they were immediately captivated by the nitrous system, the two polished bottles in the trunk. So everybody, of course, thought that, you know, this was explosive, the car was going to blow up if I was rear-ended. So I'm trying to explain this concept to Rob Cohen and Neil Moritz, and they interpret it to the, the, the function of nitrous oxide, oxide to be pretty much like a rocket engine. So Rob asked me to uh, take him for a test drive. So if you guys know anything about Universal City near Hollywood, you know that the streets there are not exactly conducive to a 0 to 80 mile an hour blast. So I had the target top off that day. So I got on the freeway with Rob. Rob's sitting next to me. And at the time, I had the big T66 on the car already. So um, I took him for a ride, got on the on-ramp, waited till the traffic was a little bit clear, rolled on in third gear, and just pegged the thing. Went through third and fourth, and by that time, I'm doing over a buck twenty. And Rob was screaming over the wind noise. He's like, "Is that the NOS? Is that the NOS?" So I was like, "Nope, that's the turbo." And so right away, he was enamored with the car. So we pulled back into the lot, and we're talking, and I'm answering questions and whatnot. And the tram, you know, the tour tram that goes around Universal Pictures, the tour tram comes around. It's full of a bunch of people. This was a late, late uh, spring day in Southern California. It was kind of warm. It was probably in the 80s. And so everybody's out there with shorts and shorts and uh, short sleeve shirts and whatnot. And so I'm dressed very casual. And as the tram comes around, the tour guide stops. He goes, hey, everybody, that's Rob Cohn over there. He did the movie The Running Man. Of course, everybody knows Arnold Schwarzenegger and they're going to The Running Man. And he says, hey, Rob, what are you working on? And Rob says, I'm putting this car in my next movie. And I'm like, he is? Oh, jackpot. So I was pretty excited. So, uh, you know, no, had, no deal had been signed at that point. No discussion had been made at that point. It was just a question of Rob saw the car and he liked it. Well, come to find out that Universal had decided that they were going to rent the cars for this movie and not buy the cars. The, the thought process being that it would be cheaper to take a, a car that's rented, build co four or five cosmetically similar cars, good enough to pass on camera, and do it that way. And he was right. It was cheaper. We had a small budget for the movie. It was about $38, $39 million. In fact, originally the movie's budget was only $25 million. But after some discussion, Doug Claiborne, who was an executive producer, fought some battles internally and got them to up the budget to 39. So back in those days, just a Talking Heads movie was 25 million bucks. So 39 million bucks was still dirt cheap for what we needed it to do. So then, of course, Rob said, well, we're going to need more cars. So I went upstairs to the office and I sat in this big, glorious office. They have office buildings there. And, you know, Rob's got these awards on his desk and all these scripts stacked up and all these pictures of him with celebrities on the wall and a bunch of chairs and a couch and a coffee table and all these documents and pictures from movies and so forth. And I'm just kind of in awe, but I'm trying to act cool like this kind of shit happens to me every day. So I'm just sitting there and David Martyr's sitting next to me and they're asking me questions. So what kind of car should we use, Craig? What, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? What do you think about the other thing? So I got up there on a little grease board and I started writing down. I said, well, here's the food chain of cars. You got the very top, the Nissan Skyline GTR. Right, that's like the granddaddy of them all, the King Mamba Jamba, that kind of thing. And then below that, you have cars like the Supra and the RX-7 and the old school Acura NSXs. Uh, the 350Z was not out yet. The WRX STI was nothing like it is today. Um, and they, I don't think they were selling the actual STI in this country yet. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a Subaru guy. So um, we're going through the food chain of cars. And they say, okay, well, this is, this is what we have right now. I said, well, I don't think Brian should start in a Supra and go to an Eclipse. It would be the other way around. You start an Eclipse, and then if you want to go better than Eclipse, no offense to Eclipse owners, you would go to a Super or an RX-7 or that kind of thing. So they said, okay, well, we're going to need to visualize this. And the best way for us to visualize this is if we bring these cars out to the Universal and take a look. And I was like, okay, how do you propose to do this? Well, you've got connections, Craig. Can you call some people? This was before the Internet, so you couldn't just you know, get on the Internet and put out a call. Um, to people on Facebook or Instagram, that kind of thing. All there really was of the Internet was automotive forms. And if you know anything about automotive forms back then, 
They were, you know, rife with trolls and, and rife with people who knew everything about cars but still didn't have a driver's license. That's what they were. So I put some call, casting calls out and I made a bunch of phone calls to people in the car show circuit. And so each Friday for the next several weeks, I would bring up a, a roster of cars. For example, they'd say, bring us RX-7s, bring us um, uh, Mitsubishi Eclipses. And so I put out the call. So whoever showed up, those were the only cars considered. We didn't go outside that. So if you saw that invite online and you didn't go, that's how we started to pick the cars. And that went on for several weeks. And so we were looking at certain cars, like we wanted an E46 M3, but we wound up with a Jetta because we couldn't afford an E46 M3 and the replicas we would need. We wound up with the Eclipse. Honda Civics had to be in the movie. A uh, couple of Integras were there, Nissan 240SX, all those kinds of cars. And so those were cars that we wanted to find, and we were successful at finding those. So that's pretty much how we picked most of the cars. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next episode. For this episode and all future episodes, I will try and put specs of certain cars underneath each video in the description. Please follow me on Instagram. If you have not already picked up a copy of the book, please do so. Uh, be happy to have you read it, and it's basically going to corroborate everything what I'm talking about here. And uh, I will see you all on episode two. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.